Well, man, it is good to see you. Welcome to church today. Can we just welcome everybody joining us online? And let's dismiss our, we'll dismiss our fifth and sixth grade right now. You guys go ahead and head to your class. Today is a big day. I got a couple of quick things before we dive in. Today is the Christmas give, wrap, and sort. Is that correct? Did I say that right? Kind of? So if you would like to be a part of, of that ministry in this room, immediately when we finish service after the 11 o'clock, we'll pack up church. And I know you're, you're like, wait, this is not a church. Yeah, that joke's dead. All right. But we're, we're going to pack up church, and then this whole place turns into a giant gift wrap center and sorting machine. And I just want to thank you right now for your generosity, church, because just o- I think just over 200 kids right here in our immediate area is going to have a Christmas this year because of your obedience and your, you know, just love for the Lord and love for people. So let's just thank Jesus for that, man. Thank you for your generosity. So if you want to be a part of that, I'm sure that uh, Chelsea and that team would be glad to welcome you to hang out and sort and rap. Some of you have the spiritual gift of rap. I've seen it. It's awesome. So let's do that together. Okay, um, last but not least before we dive in, we have had a family who had a, a just a felt a, a real call in their life to provide some Bibles for the church. If you are in need of a Bible, we would love to put one of these in your hands. And so today at the Information Center on your way out, if you need a Bible, this is a free gift for you, okay? So I'm going to make sure that those are there. They are not there now. They will be there as soon as I can get them there, all right? If somebody would like to get them there, they are on the table in A3. Okay. (laughs) Awesome. So let's thank the Lord for that too. Come on. We like to applause. We like to give Jesus some love. All right. Last week in the Gospel of Luke, we began our series by looking at two characters from the Christmas story named Zechariah and Elizabeth. And in Luke chapter 1, we saw the priest Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth were what was called good and upright people. I mean, look at, uh, I think it's verse 6. Uh, it said this in verse 6, they were both righteous in the sight of God and they walked blamelessly before the Lord. They, they participated in all the commandments and the requirements of the Lord, but they had no descendants. They had no offspring, no children. Culturally, they, that was a blessing. So culturally speaking, they, 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 they weren't walking in that type of blessing. And they had prayed for children, but she was found barren. And they hoped and they waited and they longed and they struggled and they prayed. And even, you know, even through what's known um, to us because of the canon, uh, the scriptures, as the silent years of God. They prayed. Um, this is all they ever knew, by the way, the silent years of God. They knew the prophecy of the Messiah, but the silence of God. They had heard the stories, they had heard the prophetic utterances that had been said, passed down through many generations. The last word from God that that they knew of was through the prophet Malachi as he prophesied this Elijah figure that would come, an anointed one, a Messiah type figure that would come and bring rescue. Last week we also learned that embedded within the hearts of this culture, of this time, of these people was this belief that God was interested and invested in stepping into their story to bring rescue. So from long ago, they had seen a God of deliverance step in. They had heard about how God had faithfully moved over and over on their behalf. So they believed that at some point, even in the silence of God, they believed that God would bring deliverance. They believed in the prophecy of Messiah to come. But it wasn't until Zechariah had been chosen to burn incense to the Lord in the temple when when he had that angelic visit. You know, beginning God speaking again, delivering, you know, some news. And, and the news or the message um, was this unbelieving Zechariah and this barren Elizabeth would indeed have this baby and they would name him John. We know him as John the Baptizer. He would walk in this Elijah type of anointing just like the prophet Malachi had prophesied. He would prepare the way for Jesus. Now in that we saw two things. Number one, that God's perfect will is worth any pain of waiting. And number two, God provides for his plans and chooses to use us in his purposes. So Luke chapter 1. Now this week, as we're going to go back to Luke chapter 1, we're going to see another supernatural story. Well, We'll see another supernatural conversation take place between Mary who we know is the mother of Jesus, and Gabriel, the angel from the Lord. Now, at a specific moment in time, this, when, when we see the story open, we see that God sends Gabriel to this lowly, not popular village of Nazareth to this young girl, Mary, 
who at the time is about 13 or 14 years old. That's how old she was. Very young, very humble teenage girl. Now, in a biblical sense, Mary had never known a man. She is recognized as a virgin, which is very, it's a very important detail to the greater story at large in order to align and fulfill prophecy. This is such an important detail, which is why they're so deliberate about making sure that that detail is part of the writing. Now, in the book of Isaiah, see, we saw some 700 years or so prior that this is exactly what Isaiah prophesied when he said the Messiah would, would come. He said that, that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. Look at Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. The Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. This is one of those essential foundational elements of the faith that we say is an essential. It requires faith. It, it, you can't reason or logic this one. And that's exactly what, what Isaiah had prophesied, like I said, years and years and years, some 700 years before. Important, such an important detail about Mary because not only does this support the prophecy of the Messiah, but it also points to a supernatural God who is limitless in power. There's also something else we need to know about Mary before we got, dive into the text. As, as the story opens, we know that she's betrothed to an upright man named Joseph. We'll look at him next week. Now, betrothed in the Jewish culture actually means they're already technically married, culturally speaking. Or at least legally, they're considered married. However, they've not yet had a marriage ceremony. They have not yet consummated the marriage. They are not yet living together as the husband is out preparing a house for the wife and the wife is preparing herself for her husband. So the betrothal period would usually last about a year or so and its purpose was really by design to test the fidelity of the couple. Now, we have an engagement process, right? And, and this is nothing like that. It's so much more involved, so much so that it would actually take a divorce to get out of a betrothal. So this is where we are as our story begins in Luke chapter 1. Look at verse 26 with me, and that's where we're going to start today. Luke 1, 26. It says, now in the sixth month, now when it starts the sixth month, that's actually talking about Elizabeth's term. So Elizabeth is now six months pregnant. So six months from the time that, that Gabriel had given this word to Zechariah, here we stand. And the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city. Now think, think more of village. Um, in the Greek, there's no translation for the word town. So it's more of a village. And the angel Gabriel is sent by God to this village in Galilee named Nazareth. Um, and he sent, God sends Gabriel to this virgin, betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, descendant of David, which is another important part of fulfillment of prophecy because the Messiah would be a descendant of King David. He would be part of David's lineage. And so Gabriel is now going to speak to Mary, who's betrothed to Joseph, who is a descendant of David. And that's where we are. It's verse 28. And coming in, the angel Gabriel says to her, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. Now, this was so fascinating to me when I really started to dive in and study exactly what Gabriel was saying to Mary. And I hope that it, it, it's, I hope it's just as fascinating for you. Now, when he says favored one in the Greek, I'm going to try to say this. So if you're, a, if you're a, a Greek expert, please just go with me, okay? But in the Greek, it's cheritonome. And it's related to the, the, the word charis, which is grace. Um, what Gabriel is saying, he's saying, hail, greetings, rejoice, full of grace. And, th and that phrase, full of grace, doesn't even really cut it, but it's still the best way to describe it. The use of the word, that, that cheritoname, is a one-of-a-kind word that I found. It's, it, it, it's, it's not, it's, in fact, Gabriel is using this in such a way that, that you're probably not going to see it again. You might see a derivative of it. There's another word, um, her, uh, uh, her I think I said that right, which is similar. But this, this cheritoname is a one-of-a-kind word invoked by the angel Gabriel in this moment. And listen, don't miss this. What he's actually, he's, the way he's using this word is a noun as a title. It's a title, meaning the one who grace inhabits. That's what he's saying. It's so cool. He says, the Lord is with you. Another way of saying favor, charis, grace, gift. Obviously, God has bestowed this special honor 
on Mary. She, she was this, this special recipient of his grace, but still different, um, different than just anyone receiving the grace of God. She was not only covered in grace, she would be overshadowed by grace, we'll see in a minute, but really she would embody grace. Mary inhabited grace. It was poured out upon her, lavished upon her life, but also it would grow inside of her as she carried the embodiment of it in her womb in this baby Messiah, King Jesus. So the best translation of what Gabriel says when he shows up in her you know, house, floating all 12 foot of him, whatever, how big, right, is this. He says, to this lowly, humble, poor teenage girl chosen to give birth to God in the flesh. This is what he says. He says, grace to you, and then he speaks a title over her. The one whom grace literally inhabits, the Lord is with you and in you. So cool. The Lord is with you, in you. See, this brings me to one of the main things I really want you to take away this morning. God chooses to use the ordinary and the humble to do something extraordinary and powerful. There's nothing special about Mary as far as the world is concerned. Listen to me. She's a teenage girl. She's the epitome of ordinary. To the eye, she was a nobody from nowhere. Just this this little girl who didn't have much, didn't come from much. But what the world may perceive as burdened, God sees as blessed. And he, he chooses to use the ordinary and the humble to do something extraordinary and powerful. This moment is not only a declaration, it's what we, we know is being called the Annunciation, where Gabriel is making this world-changing announcement. I mean, this is going to have ramifications on the entire world for the rest of time, and it's going to march us right into eternity. God is coming, is what Gabriel is saying. And God will dwell in humanity. He's choosing to do this through you, Mary. He's choosing to do this through you. He will physically inhabit your womb. I mean, this, is, this will absolutely change her, right? This will abso- it's going to absolutely change her marriage. It's going to change her future. It's going to change every fabric of her very life. This changes literally everything for everyone from that moment forward and forevermore. Listen, here's something else that we need to see from this moment. Not necessarily, it's not a point. I'll just say it's a sub point. It's free, all right? When God inhabits you, it changes your life. Or so it should. When God inhabits you, it changes your life. It will change everything about you. It will change your marriage. It should. It will change your future. I mean, it will change every, every fabric of your being. Every fabric of your life will be changed when God inhabits your life. God shared this plan, again, some 730 years prior through prophets and prophecies. And now here's Mary on this day hearing God's plan for Emmanuel, God with us, to come to, so to rescue, so to renew, so to redeem mankind. I'm quite sure that she was very well aware of the prophecies. I'm quite sure that she had heard the stories being passed down. And now she finds herself in this crazy supernatural moment with this angelic visitation. And scripture says in 29, she was very perplexed at this statement and was pondering what kind of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. Much like what he said to Zechariah, don't be afraid. And he says this, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you, Mary, you will conceive in your womb and give birth to a son, and you shall name him Jesus. See, much like what Gabriel did with Zechariah, he now is doing this with Mary. He tells her of God's plans, and much like Gabriel gave some attributes of John and who he would be to Zechariah, um, born to Elizabeth. Now, he's going to tell Mary some things about who Jesus will be. Look at it with me, verse 32. He says, he's going to be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. See, he was referring to God's covenant with David from 2 Samuel chapter 7. And, and his kingdom promises of, of the people of Israel all throughout Isaiah 9, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 61, Jeremiah 33. I mean, th- this, is, this is basically what um, Gabriel is, is declaring over this king, baby, Messiah, Jesus. Not only do we see these things, but in 33, he says also, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. It will have no end. See, Jesus, he came to earth to be the savior of the world, but he also came to fulfill the promise 
that God had made to the Jewish fathers. Romans 15 speaks to this. And, and now here's Gabriel. He's basically saying, hey, all of these things that have been happening, all of these stories and these prophecies from, from all of these different people are now coming together right here, right now. This is it. This is the moment. And upon hearing this in 34, Mary says to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? And basically what she's saying, how, how could this be since I've not known a man? See, in her innocence, she's saying, but, but I haven't been intimate with anybody. And Zechariah asked the same type of question. Remember when Gabriel tells him that Elizabeth's going to have a child? Same type of question, but yet different. We'll see. Zechariah says, how can this be? Luke chapter 1, verse 18. He says, how will I know this for certain? I'm old, and my wife's old too. He didn't say that in earshot. I'll tell you that straight. But rather than her, Mary's posture, Mary has this posture of innocence. Zachariah, watch this, the priest, should have known better. His, his question came from a posture of unbelief. He's like, oh, Gabriel, that's cute. My expectation has not met my experience, ever. God's been quiet. We prayed, nothing, and now she's old. Unbelief. See, his, his experience did not match his expectation or his hopes. He, he had waited so long. He didn't have faith anymore for a child. Besides, his wife, all he's ever known is her being barren. See, one of these situations is just, I love Sterling. We were talking about this in the office. Pastor Sterling, this is what he said. He said, you know, gosh, one of these situations is just unlikely, which is Zachariah's situation. It's unlikely that that could happen. But one of these situations is actually impossible. Now think about it. A virgin with a child? Let's go further. A virgin with a child carrying the Son of God? Emmanuel? Messiah? So again, look at the difference in the posture. You've got Mary versus Zechariah. His posture? Negativity. Her posture, availability. Watch what she says next. Big difference. The angel says to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For that reason also, the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. He's saying, Mary, I know this seems impossible, but God is in the business of making the impossible possible. So here's a second takeaway for you today. When we obey God, listen to me, nothing is impossible. Nothing. He goes on. He says, behold, even, even your barren old relative cousin Elizabeth herself has conceived a son in her old age. I got to know that there was a little hint of sarcasm in Gabriel right there. You're right. I mean, he says, she was called infertile, and now she's in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. This is exactly what Gabriel says. Nothing is impossible with God. He said, Mary, God can do anything. He has no limitations. I mean, look at your infertile cousin, barren, but now she's pregnant. That's God. Only God can do that. He's got a plan, and when he has a plan, he will provide. And what God promises, God delivers. And Mary's response, here it is, one of total humility and availability. This is what sets her different from Zechariah right here. Look at what she says in verse 38. She says, behold, the Lord's bondservant, may it be done to me according to your word, and then Gabriel departs. But I like the way it reads in the ESV better. Look at what it says in the ESV. It says, behold, I am the servant. I'm not God. I'm just a servant. And then she says, let it be. Let it be. If this is what you say, let it be. According to your word, let it be. Listen, God chooses the ordinary and humble to do something extraordinary and powerful. And when we obey God, nothing, nothing is impossible. Watch Mary's story. In the ancient writings, a Savior was prophesied. This would bring peace on earth and goodwill toward men. 
and it was written long ago that God would give us a sign. A young girl would conceive, though never having been with a man, and she would give birth to a baby boy. He would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Mother? Father? You are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For nothing is impossible with God. I am a servant of the Lord. May everything you have said about me come true. <laughs> a young woman says yes to the unimaginable. Her story is not the first, nor the last, when God will ask great things of his people. And when we say yes, it can change everything. say yes to God, it can change everything. Now, if I were Mary, I'd probably be like, don't be coming at me with that loud voice busting through the window like that, Shay, don't be scared, but whatever. <laughs> but seriously, when we obey God, nothing is impossible. And God chooses to use the ordinary and the humble to do something extraordinary and powerful. I hope that's good news for somebody today. You ever felt like you just didn't measure up? You ever qu questioned God, like, why do I exist? What's my purpose? Why am I breathing? And God chooses to use even what the world might think is ordinary and humble to do something extraordinary and powerful. But here's the cool thing. God knew exactly what he was going to do with Mary before the foundations of the world ever were laid. Before he breathed creation, God knew. And God knows the same thing about you. He knows exactly who he's created you to be. Exactly. So what is God saying to you this season so far? I mean, what, what is he calling you to? What has he called you to that maybe you thought was just dormant or that's long ago? But maybe those embers are still kind of burning a little. Remember what Gabriel said to Mary? Grace to you. The one whom grace literally inhabits, the Lord is with you. You are highly favored. That is who you are. That is your title. That is who you are. You're highly favored. You're not just anybody. You're, you're not just nobody from nowhere. You, you aren't just a poor, humble Jewish girl. No, listen, don't miss this. 
There was a key difference again between Zachariah and Mary. Zachariah says, well, how can this be? Remember? Remember Luke 1.18? But then Mary, here's what Mary said. Look at 38. Mary said, no, no, let it be. Let it be. That's two totally different postures. How can this be? Let it be. I will believe you, God. Why? God chooses to use the ordinary and humble to do something extraordinary and powerful. When we obey God, nothing's impossible. Let me, listen, here's what I believe is a promise about you this morning. A lot like Mary, you aren't just anybody. You aren't just nobody from nowhere. You aren't just a poor, humble creation of God. God has a divine plan for each and every one of you as well. Every one of us. We walk in a charis. We walk in a grace. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Listen, Mary may have carried the Son of God in her, but you carry the Holy Spirit in you. Let me say that again. Mary may have carried the Son of God in her, but you carry the Holy Spirit inside of you. Romans 8, the Spirit of God, He raised Jesus from the dead. Don't take my opinion. He lives in you. Christmas, come on somebody. Emmanuel, God with us. Maybe you think it's over. Maybe you are dragging your feet, putting one in front of the other, just barely making it. Listen to me. Mary may have carried God in the flesh in her womb. You carry Holy Spirit inside of you. When you surrender your life to Jesus and ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit, God will give you that gift. He is a good Father, the giver of every good and perfect gift. He will give you that gift. God chooses to use the ordinary and humble to do something extraordinary and powerful. And when we obey God, nothing is impossible. How many times do we find ourselves in a moment when God wants to be God in our lives and in our world? He gives us a command, but we just say, well, how can this be? Like Zechariah. Rather than owning the fact that we too are called by God, we are anointed by God, we are highly favored just like Mary, we need to believe and live in this posture of let it be. God, yes, and amen. You carried Messiah, but you put Holy Spirit in us. Let it be. Somebody say, let it be. Let it be. Stand up. Come on, say it loud. Let it be. Say it again. Let it be. Let it be. Yes, Lord. Father, we we say let it be. God, we thank you so much for the amazing Christmas story of hope. And Lord, I I can't help but believe there might be someone in the house that just needs hope this morning. They need to understand who you created them to be. So Lord God, would you just encourage right now, Holy Spirit, would you just cover this house? with just this blanket of assurance and grace, this blanket of peace and courage to say, let it be. Maybe you're here, you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. You've seen a whole lot of things happen today, baptisms, we've we've met with the Lord and, 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 and just ascribing greatness to his name through song. You've heard the word and I pray that that's been just empowered by the Holy Spirit. And now you're at a moment And the Lord is knocking on the door of your life saying, please let me come in and reside. Let me be your friend. This is not about religion. It's about me having a relationship with you through Jesus. Step through the gift. Step through the door of Jesus. Receive the gift of Jesus. If you have never surrendered your life to him this morning, would you just, this is not a magical prayer, but pray it with me. It's just a confession. It's just an admittance. I'm admitting If you want Jesus in your life, just say, Jesus, I believe you. I want to receive your gift of life. I want to receive your gift of forgiveness. Would you set me free 
from all of the pain of my yesterdays. Remove all of my past mistakes and make me new. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for being God with us. Thank you for the cross dying in my place. Thank you, Father God, for the gift of Jesus. Now, Jesus, would you fill me with the Holy Spirit, I pray. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, if you have prayed that prayer, there's a connect card probably in every other chair around you. Would you grab that card? Please fill that out. Would you let us know if you've committed your life to Christ maybe for the first time or maybe you're here and you're, you're recommitting your life to Christ. That is awesome. Take that card that you fill out. You can put it in one of the orange and white gift boxes in the lobby or take it to that welcome tent that you pass by on the way in. Man, we just want to reach out to you and encourage you this week. This is the greatest gift you'll ever receive. Can I tell you that? This is the greatest gift you'll ever receive. Can we just applaud and give thanks to God for all he's doing this morning? Come on, give him your best for just a minute. Sterling's going to lead us. Come on, team, lead us. Give him your best. Let's sing one more chorus.